Okay, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. Um, and I'll go ahead immediately because, um, as was already said, time is quite um, tight. And if you want some question time, I should go ahead uh, immediately. Uh, it's just impossible for within the small hour ahead of us to uh, explain about every aspect of the First World War. So what I mainly will do is I will focus on what happened in the area I come from, being Flanders. Um, and Flanders is actually, um, you see a map with Belgium in yellow, and Flanders is actually the northern part of Belgium where uh, the mother tongue is Flemish. And Flemish is actually the same as Dutch. So uh, where I come from, we speak Dutch, which is of a certain importance because um, the war actually raged for four years in where you see the small square. Um, and that's where many of the men from Scotland, but also uh, including the islands, would be uh, sent to. Uh, what is very important to know is that it is a very, very densely populated area. It is completely different than the landscape you have here on the islands. It's an entirely flat land um, with many, many villages and many towns, one near to one another. It is impossible in Flanders to go to a spot where you can't see a house. Um, and uh, as soon as you go three miles further on, you're right in the center of another village. So it's really, really very, very, very densely populated. And this is actually the area where the war came to a halt. If I get back to my former, um, actually to the right of Belgium, and to the east, you see Germany. What actually happened in August 1914 is that Germany invaded Belgium, which was the reason why the UK joined the Allies and uh, went to war. Um, and in the course of the first months of the war, um, the German troops occupied the whole of Belgium, and then the war came to a halt in the far west of the country, where you see um, the small square. Um, this is actually, just to tell something more on me, this is the main building in the town I live. This is also the building in which we have our museum and where my office is. It was a very, very famous building already before the war um, and again. Um, but what you see now, originally it was a medieval building from the 13th century. Um, Ypres, uh, that's something we have in common actually, was a textile producing uh, town. And what you see here is the cloth hall. Um, so in the Middle Ages, that's where they would trade and sell the cloth. It shows that the town was very rich thanks to the cloth. Um, nowadays it's the museum and my office is in it. But what you see here is a 20th century reconstruction because that's how the same building looked in 1919. So you see very little was, uh, was still standing by then. Um, and the reason why the whole town was literally raised to the ground and there were even spots where no two stones were left standing upon another is uh, what we called the salient. Now here you see what the salient is. I just have to point certain things out. The town is here. This is a town. What is blue are German lines, German positions and what is red and green are allied positions. Um, this map is a French map. It dates from November 1914. What is red are French troops. What is green are British troops. Um, but what is important is that you see the town is here and the front line runs to the north, to the east, and to the south of the town. And this means that if you are as a soldier, you are here, you can be shot at from three sides. Um, so you can be shot at from the south, the east, and the north. Um, this is the main reason why there was the, so many people were killed and why the destruction was so total in Ypres. Not only uh, was the town being shelled from three sides, but you also have to know that in the First World War, you already had guns with a range up to 30 miles, and some of the heavier shells weighed more than a ton, and that the front line was at a distance from what you would have here would be about eight miles, but at a certain moment in the war, the front line was only two miles from the town center. 
And this for four years, non-stop, literally four years. In October 1914, the first shells were dropped and this lasted until October uh, 1918. So that's the reason why the whole town was entirely destroyed. And in the four years of war, in the four years of war, nearly half a million people were killed in that narrow um, spot. What you see here, the most northern part to the far southern part of this map is maybe 50 miles. And within 15 square miles, half a million people were killed. So that's really uh, an enormous uh, figure. Um, something about the Scottish soldiers who were sent off uh, to Flanders. Now what is important to know is that in the beginning of the war, um, the British Expeditionary Force, as it was called, the British Army was a very small, comparatively very small, but professional army. And already in the very first months of the war, um, that army uh, was decimated, lost so many men that reinforcements were needed. And so a very important recruiting campaign, and this is one of the typical posters from that time, a very large, important recru recruitment campaign was started, which was particularly successful um, in Scotland. And first, the first man sent over, next two after the professionals, were the so-called territorials, uh, the reserve, and then pretty soon afterwards, by 1915, you would have these men from what they would call then the new army, all volunteers. And it's important to stress that because uh, most of the men who died in the First World War were not professional soldiers. They were only soldiering for the time of the war. They were doing a duty towards their country, uh, but they were fishermen, crofters, uh, school te uh, teachers, postmen, whatever you, uh, grocers, um, but just for the time of the war, they would go on soldiering. Um, many already served in the army as territorials, and I'll just quote one local source from one of the islands, and he wrote, it was then every young lad's dream to get into the militia. It was usually their first employment and the first money they earned, and many lied about their age in order to be accepted. And um, the historian Malcolm McDonald, I believe he's a uh, Lewis man, wrote that nearly all the fishermen and crofters from the Isles were reservists with the Royal Navy or the militia, as reserve battalions of the Seaford and Cameron Highlanders, the main regiments from this area, uh, receiving a retainer for annual training was very attractive because it supplemented the meager income they usually had. Um, so, just to sum up, there are a number of reasons why there were so many recruits coming from uh, the islands. First reason is the concept, the idea of loyalty and duty, which was much more embedded in society then than it was now, enhanced by the very successful recruitment campaign. Uh, there was also a certain martial tradition, a tradition to go and fight abroad. Um, as I've just mentioned, there were economic motives, uh, joining the army as a way of combating poverty. Uh, not without importance is also social pressure. Now, certainly in small communities, um, if one particular person didn't want to join, he might have been pointed at with a finger. And so many felt a certain pressure, even if they did not really want to, to go anyhow. Uh, so that's what we would, I would say social pressure. And then last but not least, there was also the call of adventure. For many, this would be the only opportunity ever in their life to see something of the world. And so, uh, another reason to join up. In total, for the whole of Scotland, on a population of about 5 million, 550,000 Scottish soldiers were sent abroad. So that's about 10%, more than 10% of the population. And of them, uh, eventually, 147,000 would not come back. So staggering figures, but I'll come back to that later on. And when they arrive in Flanders and in northern France, um, these Scots are just part of a multitude of armies. Um, both the French and the British brought over troops from all over their empires, um, making a very strange situation right behind uh, the front line and in, on the battlefields of Flanders and France. Uh, they would encounter people like on the left, Tirailleurs Senegalais, which came from the whole of West Africa, or Spahis on your right, with a typical Flemish mill coming from 
uh, North Africa, or um, Indians in the Indian Army Corps, and I especially stress those because um, the Indian Army then was usually composed, one brigade was composed of four battalions. A battalion is about 750 men. And of each brigade, three battalions would be Indian and one battalion would be <coughs> British. And the British battalion was quite often a Scottish unit. And again, you'll see an example of that uh, later on. You can see this is fairly early in the war. No destruction yet. Uh, you can actually go with this picture in your hand to the same place because the houses on the background have been reconstructed identically. Um, you can see that there's not even a trench yet. It's just a parapet that they built. Um, and there's even a civilian, a Belgian, looking on, on what is happening uh, in the background. And amazingly enough, there were even 140,000 Chinese <coughs> working behind the front line in Flanders. So you see it was really uh, many people from many different backgrounds, each speaking their own language, um, which made it, especially for the local population, it was a very strange situation because the local population um, all of a sudden became a very small minority in its own country. And they might have been, in the time of the war, only 10% of a temporary population of millions of soldiers from all over the world. And most of the people in Belgium, just like most of the people and most of the soldiers who came from Scotland and from the Isles, would have never laid eyes upon an African or an Indian or a Chinese. So that was probably the first time they would have encountered someone from another continent, from another race. Um, and something on the image of the Highlander. The Highlander as exotic species in the eyes of friends and foe. Um, and even though there was no such thing as a Scottish army, um, tradition and the geographical organization of the army had provided for clearly Scottish units. So um, Scots wore their own uniform consisting of a kilt with a unit tartan and a sporran and a glengarry or a tarn on the head. Um, and it's not surprising that the Scottish units appealed to the imagination of the German opponents who devoted many cartoons to those whom they called the Damen von Höhle, and that's German for the ladies from hell, uh, ladies because of the kilt, and then from hell because they were seen as being fierce soldiers, uh, but also with the local population. What you see here is to the right, this is a French comic strip published in 1914, where you see a, a cartoon, caricature, stereotype of a Scottish Highlander, and to the left, that's um, a German propaganda token, made very early in the war, September 1914, and you actually see um, a Scottish Highlander pushing the Indians towards the front. It has been made the moment the Indians arrived in France uh, in order to march up to the front line. Um, so, from very early in the war. Um, especially pipes and drums were crowd pullers to the local population, but so were the kilts. And um, I'll read out some uh, witness accounts from local Belgian sources, Flemish sources, um, and the first two are, are by um, priests in Belgium, Catholic priests. Uh, they were the most literate men, so they got many diaries, many memoirs. And Ypres priest César Gezelle, already published in 1915, his memoirs of the beginning of the war, and he wrote, and I quote, from time to time, a regiment of Scottish Highlanders marched past. People on the streets called them the skirt men, with legs as thick as hams, broad-shouldered, thick-necked. They laughed at the great success of their skirts. Of course, not knowing the word kilt, uh, he would say skirt. But not everyone was charmed by the skirts. Um, another Catholic priest, Father Edmundus of the Abbey of St. Sixtus, entered in his diary on the 13th of June 1915, immoral clothing of the Scots. A short skirt instead of trousers, and some say they wear short pants under it, others claim they don't. Uh, the Germans also wondered whether the Scots wore anything under their kilt, and on Christmas Day 1914, some received an answer to this question. Lieutenant Johannes Niemann of a Saxon Reserve Infantry Regiment left an extensive testimony 
of an unofficial Christmas truce just south of Ypres. And his unit was then opposite a battalion Seaford Highlanders. And that means that uh, that battalion would certainly have included um, people from the islands. And I quote him, Shortly later, a Scot suddenly appeared from nowhere with a football. It was difficult to play on the hard soil. Everyone played full of enthusiasm. And we, Germans, roared with laughter when a gust of wind suddenly showed us that the Scots did not wear any underwear under their kilt. We shouted and whistled whenever we saw the bare backside of one of yesterday's enemies. And then, not without importance, he adds, the game ended 3-2 for Fritz. So you have a German, Scottish, Interland, international football game here on Christmas Day, 1914. The Scottish were also very popular with the local children. And another local priest, Ashil Vawala, had noted in his diary on the 22nd of March, 1915, this afternoon, in the field, this afternoon in the field behind my house, a dozen kids are playing. First, they dig trenches. Then, they put an old stovepipe in the hatch, and that's their gun. Then, they make a fort with large empty boxes they put on top of another. The battle will begin, but first they have to dress up. Rolling up the trousers, rolling down the stockings, and an apron around their middle. They are Highlanders. Four go together in the middle of the boxes to defend. And on a given sign, all of a sudden, the other eight start throwing with boxes and earth. The beleaguered hide until they cannot longer take a stand and have to surrender. So this is an account of local children in Flanders playing Highlander. In the German eyes, um, the image of the, Scot, of the Scottish soldier was a bit double. Uh, on one hand, the uh, Germans considered the Scottish as being more savage, but also having much more um, character. And the photograph you see here is a portrait made of a Scottish prisoner of war, uh, photographed by the camp commander Otto Stiel. And he published a small book in 1916 with all portraits of the man he would find in his prison of war camp. And in his introduction on the booklet, he writes uh, about the Scots, um, and he makes the following note. Special group of prisoners, half of Celtic and half of Scandinavian stock. The brooding gaze they have in our portraits prove that they are of an entirely different nature than the English." End of quote. Um, but there's more. In the prisoners of war camps, the Germans also conducted extensive scientific research. And particularly there was one professor called Wilhelm Dögen, and he was very interested in, uh, what's in ethnic music, in uh, popular music, folk music. And so he made a lot of sound recordings in all the uh, prisoner of war camps. And one of the men he recorded is the piper here um, to my left, and your left as well, yeah, piper here, called Alexander Smart. And I brought, I brought a small sound fragment, only a minute and a half, uh, and it's a recording of this piper in 1916 in a German prisoner of war camp. Uh, you will first hear Professor Dögen announcing what he's going to record, and then you'll, and then you'll hear uh, Alexander Smart, the Scottish prisoner of war, playing. Oops. So, if not 
the oldest, it's certainly one of the oldest recordings of Scotland the Great, and it's a bit ironical, but it's thanks to the Germans that we still, uh, that we have it actually. I'll go over to the next part of my talk. I've called it Total War, Total Destruction. And why Total War? Because the First World War was the first so-called Total War. And with Total War, I mean that, um, first of all, that the destruction, they used all means to destroy the enemy. So it was really an industrial warfare. And you will see that it led to complete destruction, but also because the whole of society was involved in the war effort. Um, and that's why they would use the words, for instance, home front. The home front or by those working for the war effort at home. Uh, and by consequence, no one was guilty anymore. In the old days, before the First World War, a war was fought between soldiers. After the First World War, a war is fought between entire countries. And uh, the civilians, the civilian population in a country, also become a target because they are no longer innocent they take their part in the war effort. And um, Scottish troops were there from the very, very beginning of the war. Um, this is a photograph of men of the Royal Naval Division uh, working at Antwerp. Antwerp is a big port in the north of Belgium. Um, and it's quite important because it's only when Antwerp fell, there would have been a large retreat. And then after that, only they would start digging in and making the trenches. What you see here is. Uh, Belgian soldiers and British troops uh, laying barbed wire in order to stop uh, the invaders. Um, but when Antwerp fell, which was in the first week of October 1914, the Belgian and the British armies that were there around Antwerp had to try to escape. And they only had a very narrow corridor to do so. A narrow corridor between the Dutch border, the border with Holland, and the advancing German troops. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they look so exhausted. Uh, the two men on the forefront are British. The two next men uh, with, the, with the dark uniform, uh, they are Belgians. And what actually happened is that either on purpose or by accident, quite a number of Belgian, but also of British troops, crossed the border and ended up in Holland. And Holland, as a neutral state, had to disarm these men and had to lock them up in so-called internment camps. Now, the Britons were, uh, went to a place in the north of Holland called Groningen, nicknamed by the Britons Timbertown because they were in wooden um, huts. Um, and quite a number of them, quite a number of these men came from the islands. At least 106, but probably more, came from Lewis. Um, but it's I do not know about the other figures, that's why I only give the number of Lewis men who were there. And their war experience would have been completely different. They would have, uh, their war experience would have consisted of utter boredom and an utterly flat land. Not feeling useful, uh, feeling they're wasting time and money being there. However, there is a certain importance in their stay in Holland, and that's why I mention it here, because recently a book has been published on that camp and in the book, it's explicitly stated that Gallic divine services with Gallic Bibles were organized in the camp. And that even the men from the islands gave Gallic language lessons to other internees and themselves taking courses such as navigation courses, which would come in handy after the war. Um, in total, eight died in the camp. And of the eight British soldiers who died, three were from Lewis. And um, this is a photograph, I had to scan it from the book, so it's a bit less good, uh, of um, the funeral of John McClay, who died on the 26th of August 1915. And he was from Shadr Barvis in Lewis. And the man in the camp paid for his headstone with the contribution of the local, uh, of the local government. And during his funeral, hymns in Gaelic uh, were sung. Uh, there are many photographs of this funeral. This is just one of them. There was also a report published in the local press uh, which shows that these British soldiers were actually quite popular within the local community. And that's a photo of the uh, cemetery in Groningen nowadays. And the Celtic cross, you see, that's uh, the grave of uh, that uh, John McClay from uh, Lewis. 
Now then, back to Ypres. In Ypres, the war begins, or well, the war begins in August, but uh, entrenchments and a static warfare begins uh, towards the end of October 1914, when uh, what you see here are two fragments from um, the diary of Major Edward Crofton. Uh, he was an upper-class uh, person, Sir uh, Major Edward Crofton, um, serving in the cavalry, and he was quite, felt quite angry because they had to dismount and they had to start digging trenches while he had hoped to go through the war sitting on his horse and fighting like they used to do in the old days. Um, to the left you can see a small drawing he makes with Ypres in the middle and then the salient, yeah, so the bulge in the front line to the right of it. And on the little drawing right he, uh, he makes a drawing of his, his first trench. And you can read with me, um, sites made of doors and timber from Zellebeke Zole destroyed houses. So they went into the local <coughs> villages and in the destroyed houses they took all the timber and all the doors they could take to um, reinforce it. Um, already in these first battles, soldiers from the islands were killed. Uh, the first territorial from the islands to be killed was uh, most probably, he was first, definitely the first one from what used to be killed, 39-year-old Simon Macquarie, who was killed on the 26th of October 1914. And um, the new Simon Macquarie, I would say, uh, that was actually the grandfather of, of the man hiding in the corner over there. Um, and what's not without importance is Simon brought these two shell cases, but well, one shell case and one shell with him, and these were given to him when we visited the field on which uh, his grandfather got mortally wounded, um, heavily wounded. And these were given to him by the farmer who is now um, farming, working that field where his grandfather got mortally wounded so many um, years ago. I brought something else along with me, and that is that during that first battle of Ypres there were many critical moments. And for instance, at a certain moment, there was an attack of the Prussian Guards, a German elite unit near Nonnebossen on the 11th of November 1914. And at least 50 men from the islands were killed. And among them, among them, there was a certain Donald McClough from East Tabard and Donald Montgomery from Derricklet. So actually, people from just around. And I actually brought some pieces, like this one, some pieces of shell, which a week and a half ago I went to pick up on that particular battlefield. And I will leave them here for the school. Um, you can put them on display or uh, give them to the history teacher, or uh, it's up to you. Um, but they're German shell pieces from the First World War. And it's quite important because on that very spot, uh, on the 11th of November 1914, um, of the whole battalion, and I've already explained that's about 750 men, only 140 survived that day. Um, and only one month ago, a new memorial was erected on that very spot, just to show you that it's we're really talking about quite an important um, place and event. This is another very interesting photograph, which I came across uh, in our museum's collection. And... Um, when I came across it, there was no caption whatsoever, so there was no identification. But in the end, it wasn't hard to know who these men were, where they were, and when this was taken. For you can clearly see that they are Scottish, well, we can recognize the tartan, and uh, the tartan tells us that these are Seaford Highlanders. This is a unit which always had islanders among it. Um, but then the question was which battalion of the Seaford Highlands? Well, the clue is given um, at the end of the trench, um, where you can see someone with a turban. So these are Seaford Highlanders serving with the Indian Army um, in northern France in 1914. Um, it must be at the very, very beginning of the war, because the trench hasn't been reinforced yet. It's just a ditch being dug in the earth. And also another clue for that we at the very beginning of the war is the fact that the, the trees still have leaves. So this must be October or at the latest early November uh, 1914. If you have a proper look at the photograph, you can see that the Indian fellows in the back are evacuating someone 
who has been shot, someone who is wounded. And you can also see that um, they have their little dog with them. And that will come in handy uh, because after a while, the trenches were really uh, infested with uh, rats and other vermin. And if you had a dog with you, that at least could chase somewhat uh, the rats away. So um, it would come in handy a bit later on. Um, trench, when you were in the trenches, normally you would be four days in a front line trench, four days in a support trench, and four days out of the trenches. But when you were out of the trenches, that did not mean that you could spend uh, your days in idleness. When you were out of the trenches, you had to do uh, rather menial work, like repairing roads, laying railroads, um, or other kinds of uh, jobs. And this is a typical camp. When they were in a camp, so in the four days that they were out of the trenches, uh, they would live either in wooden huts or in tents, uh, canvas tents such as this one. Now, um, I want to go through a couple of um, aerial photographs and trench maps of that period. And particularly from one section of the front, just east of Ypres, where many Scottish troops have been involved. This is a very early one. This dates from, as you can see, uh, from the top right, uh, from the 15th of June, 1915. But the reason why it was dressed up is because uh, one day later, there would be a major attack on this area. Um, just point out the several parts of it. So Ypres is over there. Um, this is a lake called Badewar the Lake. And all the red lines you see, they are German trenches. The blue lines, well, they come in rather black here, are British trenches. But what is particularly interesting, and that points out that an attack is at hand, is the fact that here you have several lines close to one another, and also here, twice, four trenches next to one another. And, um, let's get back to the mic. Uh, what you have there are so-called assembly trenches. And assembly trenches were trenches dug very near to one another to assemble as many men as possible for the coming attack. Um, but, and that's something typical for the First World War, which also unfortunately happened on the 16th of June 1915, um, you only need one machine gun to stop 800 attacking soldiers. And that's exactly what happened uh, there. So the idea of assembling as many men as possible and storming the enemy uh, wasn't, uh, was to no avail, actually. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the same sector of the front, but it's taken at a different angle. Um, in the middle, top middle, you can see the lake, and here you can clearly see these assembly trenches. Over here. Um, and you see all the lines you see are actually trenches that have been dug and you can already see small dots here and there and the small dots are shell holes so that's where the grenade actually dropped um, and that's how the same area would look from the ground and um, you can see the sandbags uh, of the trench um, I'll just point out some other details but the important thing is that here there must be hundreds of soldiers but of course not one of them is that stupid to pop his head above the parapet because then he would be shot immediately by a sniper. So they all hide in the trenches. Um, what you see here is the second British line. This is the first British line, there's someone buried here. And the German first line is here. Which means that no man's land here was actually just the men in the road in between would have been 15 20, maybe 25 yards, but definitely not more. Um, and what they nicknamed Tunnel Cottage was in the hands of the Germans, giving the Germans a perfect overview of the situation within the British positions. And this is the last aerial photograph from that same area. Um, what is important here is that you see we're one year later um, this, more, this resembles more the, loop, the moon than it would uh, resemble a normal landscape. Um, so much has been destroyed. Uh, every dot you see is a shell that has dropped and a shell hole that has made. And the large 
round marks you see to the right of the photograph, these things here, these are mine craters. So what they would do is digging a tunnel under the enemy positions and blowing the enemy up. And all of these craters, they are still there. If you walk uh, the fields now around Ypres, you can come across large craters uh, created during the First World War. And this is a very last aerial photograph I want to show um, because it shows what we still do with it today. Uh, if you give the aerial photograph the right angle and the right scale, you can insert them in today's satellite photographs. And with this in your hand, uh, everyone who lives in the area can know that, oh, in that corner of my garden, there was a trench, or there used to be um, a German position or whatever. And so it's of great use to archaeologists, but also to government people and so on. But this is a very good aerial photograph. I'll just point out to you the British lines, the German lines, and no man's land. So this is the, German, uh, the British side. This is the first British line. This is no man's land and the ge first German line. Now you can see that sometimes no man's land is really wide, but sometimes no man's land can be extremely narrow. And this spot was nicknamed Caesar's Nose. And Caesar's Nose was a real hot spot. And you can clearly see it on uh, this aerial photograph that a lot of fighting has been going on there um, by the white mark and all the shell holes. This is a very, really an extraordinary photograph taken during a German raid on a British trench. Um, comes from a German soldier's photo album. Um, the, what you see there down on the right are the legs of a British soldier that was probably being killed. You can tell he's British because you can see his putties. Um, and the British were the only ones to have putties. Uh, you can see these two German soldiers, they have typical buttons for raids in their hands, either a pistol and a hand grenade, they have their gas mask out, and they're wearing a white armlet. And the white armlet is to recognize each other, to identify each other in the text of the fight. So this was taken during the raid. What is important to remember about the raid is that uh, it's something that is typical from the First World War, small minor attacks on an enemy position in order to capture some of the other side to interrogate them and to get intelligence um, or to do a reconnaissance or even just to, and it's sometimes written explicitly by those in command, um, only to maintain the fighting spirit. I've just mentioned the Christmas truces. Well, during the Christmas truces in 1914, uh, it was realized that a situation of trench warfare uh, could lead to a situation of live and let live. And of course, uh, for those in command, that could be dangerous. Suppose the soldiers did not want to fight anymore. So they, these raids could be organized at any time um, also to uh, maintain the fighting spirit. Now, if you would spend four days and four nights in a trench such as the two you see to the left, it could lead to a terrible disease called trench feet. And trench feet are actually is not is nothing else than your feet that start to rot. So many soldiers actually lost their feet, lost limbs because of the situation in the trenches. Uh, and this brings me to something else that was really um, an, an, a watershed in not only the history of the First World War, but in world history in general, if you would ask me. On the 22nd of April 1915, um, you had the first chemical attack, uh, the start of chemical warfare near Ypres. Why is it such an important event? Because it's also the first use of a weapon of mass destruction. And unfortunately, it's still very relevant today. Um, I mean, just to remind you, a uh, little more than a year ago, um, gas was used in Syria against the civilian population. Well, it's something that's actually started at Ypres uh, a bit less than 100 years ago. Now, from that first gas attack, we do have a very poignant witness account. 
a witness account that has not been written down by one of the casualties, French, it was a German gas attack, uh, uh, French or British, but by a German gas pioneer, and the pioneer is an, an engineer, um, called Willy Siebert. Strange enough, he wrote it in English because after the war he immigrated to the United States. And Siebert describes how in the weeks before the 22nd of April 1950, <coughs> gas canisters were brought to the front and they were positioned, they were set in the trenches, one every 10 to 15 yards. And they had to wait till the wind was blowing in the right direction, at least for them, which was the case on the 22nd of April 1915. The order came to open the valves of all these canisters and then Siebert describes how a greenish, grayish cloud is formed and how this cloud goes slowly but steadily over no man's land in the direction of the enemy. And when this cloud arrives at an enemy trench, he hears the biggest noise he had ever heard in his life. All these soldiers on the other side are shooting whatever rifle they have, but laconically he writes, with bullets you cannot stop a gas cloud. Um, they are all shouting, they're all screaming. Uh, ten minutes later, only far away in the distance, he still hears an occasional shout uh, or shot. And another couple of minutes later, it's a complete silence. And again, uh, and, and, and this time he's really amazed, because as he writes, for the very first time since I was on the front line, there was a complete silence. He waits another couple of minutes, and then he climbs over the parapet and walks upright in what was just before still no man's land. And again, he's amazed, and he says, if I should have tried this uh, half an hour ago, I might have made it for two, two, uh, two or three yards, and then I would have been shot by a sniper. But now I was able to walk upright in no man's land. And he also sees how part of the gas cloud is still hanging <coughs> among the shrubs and in the trees. And he also, all of a sudden, he notices how birds have fallen out of the trees and how mice and rats and rabbits have come out of their holes and are lying dead, and how even the insects are dead. And when he arrives at the first, where he was, they were French opposite, at the first French line, there's no one to be seen. All these soldiers have fled. But between the first and the second line, he already sees some horses. And once past the second line, he sees tens and tens of dead French soldiers. And he realizes it must be here that these fleeing soldiers were overtaken by the gas. And when he has a proper look at some of them, he sees how in a vain attempt to get some air, some of them have clothes open, they throw their throats using their fingernails. So they must have died in a complete agony. And then he ends this part of his memoirs by stating, at that very moment, I realized that nothing would be um, as it was before. Um, and actually, when you see in any war, that a new weapon has been introduced, like gas in the First World War, you will see three consequences. And the first consequence is a search for protection. The gas, in 1915, a gas mask does not yet exist. But you remember the photo I showed you of the raid? Yeah, you already had the gas mask hanging in front of the soldiers. Well, by 19, late 1916, you have proper gas masks. A second consequence is when a new weapon is introduced, that weapon will be more and more sophisticated. Um, the first gas used here on this photograph is chlorine gas. It suffocates. But for instance, on the 12th of July 1917, again at Ypres, for the first time, mustard gas is used. It's called mustard gas because it has the smell of mustard. And mustard gas is a dreadful weapon because it burns all the weak parts of one's body. Um, and the French name for mustard gas is Iperite. So the name of my town uh, is reflected in the name of the gas. And then the third consequence, and that brings me to the next photograph as well, is what I would call a retaliation. The first reaction of the British and the French is one of indignation. Well, how dare you use this dreadful weapon and that's not a fair way of fighting. But the second reaction is one of, but if you may use it, we as well. So French and British will start producing gas as well. Um, and that brings me to the next big battle, the Battle of Luz, 25th of September 1915. Again, a battle in which many islanders uh, were killed. Now, the Battle of Luz is important for a number of reasons. 
Uh, first, it was the really large British offensive on the Western Front. And secondly, it was also the first British, major British gas attack. But something went wrong. Uh, once the gas was released, the wind turned. And the gas clouds went back into the British lines and more British soldiers were killed actually than German soldiers were. And it was also the first major deployment of territorials and new army units, so of non-professional soldiers. And in total, 70,000 men took part in this battle, half of them being Scottish. And the result, or one of the results, was 20,000 dead and at least one-third Scottish. And this means that more Scots died in the Battle of Luz than uh, they have died in the Battle of Caledon. Um, the results overall were minimal. Also here, on that battlefront I have already shown you, um, on the same day there was a diversion attack in which some um, 800 Scots were killed. And I found uh, the following quote, Saturday 25th September, by a local priest, at 3 a.m. Several English attacks near Hooge, and that's Hooge, after blowing up several German trenches. They conquered three trenches and north and south of uh, the Menin Road. They managed to advance 600 meters. They take 160 prisoners of war who have been marched through Vlaamertingen later on this day. Unfortunately, they suffered many losses on their side, and especially the Scots have been too boisterous. They have advanced further than they were ordered to and got stuck in the barbed wire that was hidden in the grass. Subsequently, they were taken under my fire by machine guns, and it is told that 800 Scots were left behind, either killed or taken prisoner. And that's what happened in this uh, small section of field. Most men were actually killed by artillery, either large or small, so by, uh, fired by the guns. And the effect of the artillery, well, this is another artillery piece, uh, this is another one. What actually would happen is, when these things are fired, once in the air, above the enemy trench, they would explode. And so these shell parts, like this one, or like this one, would be thrown in the air at a high speed, and they would just destroy everything <coughs> and everyone they would encounter. Um, that's the reason why there were so many missing on the Western Front, because most soldiers were literally blown to bits. <coughs> and that's the reason why those who survived were of, very often uh, entirely maimed, such as the, the soldier to the right who lost uh, both legs. And I will end with this statistic, very disturbing statistic, where you can see that actually from all the Western countries, so apart from Turkey and Serbia, from all the Western countries, uh, Scotland uh, was the country that had, where most soldiers had been killed. Uh, one in four serving in the Scottish battalions have been killed, while it, the, 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 the average in the British armies was uh, 12%. So there's a clear distortion. But I put a question mark. And why did I put a question mark? Because it's important to stress that many Scots served in Scottish units, and thus in a Scottish uniform, and when they died, they ended up in the statistics as Scottish. But also the fact that there were so many missing rendered it difficult to make a definite casualty list. But yet, it does not explain entirely the distortion between these figures. Um, of the islands, approximately one man on two went off to war, and one in six was killed, which are staggering figures, and it's, uh, fig figures, and especially for a small community, um, for a small community, losing quite a number of the men was significant. And um, there's more, because despite the fact that returning veterans expected the government to fulfill its promise of land, uh, that was not the case, and it ultimately led to civil unrest and even more um, immigration and great bitterness about the lack of uh, recognition. And just to give you one uh, figure, um, that is that between 1921 and 1931, half a million Scots immigrated, so another 10% of the population. So you can see that not only the Great War uh, caused a drain of the population, but also the effects of the war. Um, it was really a very important moment, both in Scotland um, as in Flanders. And I would end with uh, this image of a local memorial 
and the Scottish Memorial um, in Flanders. I'm afraid there is no time anymore for questions. I really did hurry, but um, it's just impossible. <coughs> Anyhow, I hope you've learned a lot, and who knows, we might see each other one day in Ypres.